Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the video lecture for chapter two. Uh, in this chapter, we are going to introduce our truth functional connectives. Um, we are going to introduce the first sentences that are fully in our logical language, right? Those are known as schema. Um, so by the time that you finish this chapter, you should understand what a schema is, what a logical operator is, and what it means for an operator to be truth functional. And you should be able to reproduce the truth tables for each logical operator and use them to analyze simple sentences. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few sentences in English um, that I'm then going to break down into our logical language so that you can see what the operators look like. Then I'm going to list all of the operators, give you the truth tables for them, and again, some more English examples of how those operators are represented in um, the English language as opposed to our logical language. So for our first example, consider the sentence, Quine will not eat a pie. Uh, this is a statement, right? It has to be either true or false. Um, I think it's actually true because Quine's dead and the dead don't eat pies, but regardless. Um, so this is a statement, right? And it doesn't look like it's a compound statement at all, um, but there is actually a logical operator hidden in here. And that logical operator is the operator uh, that gets expressed in English as nod. Um, so the name for the logical operator that uh, signifies the same thing as the word not in English is negation, right? And we can see this sentence has a logical operator in there a little more clearly if we were to rewrite it in um, a more perspicuous form, right? So if we wanted to say the same thing as Quan will not eat a pie, but we really wanted to hammer home that um, the sentence has a negation operator in it, we would write, uh, I highly suggest you don't write like this in other contexts, but it is not the case that Quine will eat a pie, right? And so in this more, uh, clear form, right, we can see that negation uh, means it is not the case, right? This sentence here says the same thing as our original sentence, right? It just makes it a little clearer that negation is what's going on. So if we were to use uh, a letter to represent the statement, Quine will uh, eat a pie, right? We would pick uh, the most logical choice is P, so we use a lowercase p, and we'll say that that means Quine will eat a pie, right? So the way that we would represent this in our logical language is uh, with a special symbol for the not there. So we could just write not p. And that would say the same thing as our original sentence, right? Um, but we, we're gonna have a special symbol for it, or two special symbols for it, actually. Uh, so the first special symbol for negation looks like this, right? Um, I don't know what the name for that symbol is. Uh, it's like a negation sign. So we could write not p like so, and that would say with this translation key, the same thing as Quan will not eat a pie. Um, the other way that we represent negation in our language, and uh, this is a little atypical if you've taken another logic class, is we draw a bar, a single bar over the P, like so. So these are the two ways that we can represent negation in our language, and with this translation key, both uh, this and this say that it is not the case that Quine will eat a pie, or in uh, better English, I guess, Quine will not eat a pie, right? Okay, now we're going to look at the truth table for negation. And so what the truth table does is it tells us the technical, logical meaning of our logical operators. Um, so when looking at this table, it's important to keep in mind that uh, 
I'm going to use a capital T, right, to represent true, and uh, an upside down T to represent false. And if you've taken another logic course, you may have used a, a capital letter F to represent false. You're not allowed to do that here um, for uh, various reasons. I think it's just way clearer to read the upside down T after you get used to it, right? So what a truth table does is it shows us, based on every possible combination of truth values um, for the original statement, uh, how that statement how the, the whole statement um, that contains the negation is going to turn up based on its components, right? Th this will make some sense after you see an example, right? So for the statement um, P, uh, the lowercase letter P that represents a statement, uh, no matter what statement it represents, we know based on the first chapter that every statement has to be either true or false and those are the only two options. So in this column here, we have P, we're gonna write true, and false, right? It doesn't matter what P stands for. No matter what it stands for, as long as it stands for a statement, it's gotta either be true or false. That's just what the definition of a statement is, right? And so we have two ways of representing negation again. We have the little turnstile thing um, and then a bar over the P here. Uh, and so, as you might expect, what negation does uh, is uh, if the original statement is true, right, and you say, like, say P stands for 1 plus 1 equals 2, right, and then when you, you negate it, the whole compound statement, not P, becomes false, right? So, switches the truth value. Um, similarly, if you have a statement that's false, right, uh, one plus one equals three, and then you say, uh, it's not the case that one plus one equals three, or one plus one is not equal to three, that's true because the original statement is false, right? Now, uh, if memorizing these truth tables uh, seems painful to you, um, and you will have to memorize them, uh, everything going forward in the course builds on these tables, right? Um, you could instead just memorize the definition of negation, right? So this truth table, what it shows us, means the same thing as the sentence, the negation of a statement is true if the original statement is false. And false if the statement is true. And this is really just what the word not means in English. So if I were to give you the statement one plus one is equal to three, right? Um, that's a false statement. So if I say uh, it's not the case or not for brevity, one plus one is equal to three, right? The original statement is false because one plus one is equal to two, right? But this compound statement that incorporates our logical operator as a whole is true, right? Because it's true that one plus one is not equal to three. Uh, it's true that it's not the case that one plus one is equal to three. Similarly, if we take a statement that is true, uh, let's take all bachelors are unmarried. But that's just what the word bachelor means. If you're a bachelor, you're unmarried. Um, so all bachelors are unmarried is going to be true. Uh, if we were to represent this statement, put it into uh, a letter, we could represent it with the lowercase letter. B, right? So B would be true. Uh, 
Now, if we were to add a negation there and say that all bachelors are not unmarried or it's not the case that all bachelors are unmarried, we would represent that in our logical language, like so, with a thingy in front of the B. Sorry, I don't know the name of that symbol. Um, or a bar over the B, right? Uh, that would be false. Because B is true, right? All negation does, if you have the negation of a statement, um, it's, it switches the truth value, right? So if your original statement uh, is false, like 1 plus 1 equals 3, and you negate it and say 1 plus 1 is not equal to 3, the whole new statement that has a negation in it is true. If your original statement, like all bachelors are unmarried, is true, and you negate it like so, uh, the negation is going to be false. Right? And that's about all you really need to know about negation. It's the logical operator that matches up with the English word not. Uh, now, sometimes you will have sentences like Quine didn't eat an apple. And we can say that uh, we can put uh, for A, Quine ate an apple. Right? Um, and then we would represent this whole statement, Quine didn't eat an apple, in our logical language, with either not A like that, or not A like that. Right? So sometimes you're going to run into an English sentence that doesn't literally have the word not in it. You're going to have words like didn't or wouldn't um, or won't, right? So you have to be on the lookout for subtle negations like that. Uh, but more or less, these are pretty easy to detect. We all have a pretty good sense of how negation works in English, right? So let's move on to the next truth functional. Actually, I forgot one important thing about negation. Um, all of our other operators are binary operators. That means that they take two different statements as arguments. You'll see what I mean when I get to them. Um, negation is a unary operator, right? So um, with negation, you can negate a single schema. All of the other operators involve at least two um, schema, schemata. Um, so keep in mind that negation, this is perfectly legitimate, even though uh, we call these logical connectives, right? Negation isn't really connecting A with anything here. All it's doing is saying that, it, uh, that A is not true. Okay, our next logical operator is conjunction. Um, the most common and straightforward English word that corresponds to conjunction is the word and, right? So if we look at this sentence here, <clears throat> excuse me, all apple pies are delicious and I eat ice cream for breakfast, right? So the word and there indicates that um, this is a compound statement uh, and the logical connective that connects the two components is conjunction. The first component, all apple pies are delicious. The second component, I eat ice cream for breakfast. Right? Those are both statements. They either have to be true or not true probably false that all apple pies are delicious, right? Um, and so what conjunction means, the, the formal English definition, is that a conjunction of any number of statements is true if they are all true, and false if at least one of them is false. Right. So if you've taken a logic class before, you're probably used to there being a symbol for conjunction. So in some classes, uh, some textbooks use a little dot like P and Q like that. I can't write. Um, some logic textbooks use uh, an ampersand, which I can't really draw, right, to symbolize conjunction. But in our logical language, the conjunction of P and Q is represented like this, PQ. Um, so if you don't see a logical operator connecting two variables that represent our statements, then you know that you have a conjunction. So let's look at the truth table for this logical operator. Um, 
since this is our first logical operator that has that connects two different statements and not just one, we'll need to fill out the truth table to have a P and a Q, right? So you know that because P and Q represent statements, they can either be true or false. So for this more complex truth table, what we want to do is we want to look at the way in which the truth value of the conjunction P and Q depends upon the truth values of its component statements, P, Q, right? So we know that we're going to need four uh, columns in our truth table, right? Because there are four different possible combinations of truth values. Truth value just means whether it's true or false for P and Q. So the way that we construct, the way that we get to all the possible truth values is True, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Um, you don't really need to know this, but a truth table uh, is always going to have two to the power of n uh, columns where, uh, or where n is equal to the number of variables. Uh, and 2 to the power of 2 is 4, right? Okay, so remember, a conjunction of any number of statements is true if they're all true and false if at least one of them is false, right? So our truth table for conjunction, if you understand that sentence, is going to look like this, right? So if P is Q and if, if P is true and Q is true, then the conjunction P and Q is going to be true. If P is true and Q is false, the conjunction P and Q is going to be false because, remember, uh, the whole thing, the whole conjunction is false if at least one of them is false, right? Similarly, if P is false and Q is true, the whole thing's false, and if they are both, uh, both P and Q are false, then the whole thing is false. So a conjunction only comes out true when both of the components are true, right? And this pretty much mirrors the way in which we use the word and in English. So if I were to tell you uh, that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 and 1 plus 1 is equal to 3, right? So 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 is true. I hope you all know that. 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 is false. So if you were to ask whether or not the whole compound sentence 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 and 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 is true, uh, I think you would all say that it's not true um, because one of the components of the sentence is false and the way in which we ordinarily use the word and uh, in a compound sentence if it's connected with conjunction then all of the parts have to be true, right? So there are some other words that we use in English that mean conjunction that you might not realize it at first, right? So again, because I've said that uh, conjunction corresponds to and, P and Q would be uh, a surefire clue that we have conjunction going on, but some less clear or less obvious ones, um, P but Q, uh, means the same thing, but also indicates conjunction. So does P although Q. Right? So, if we were to say, uh, let's have uh, Quine ate a cookie and Quine ate a tart, right? So we can represent quine a cookie with a lowercase c. We can represent quine a tart with a lowercase t, right? So all of these mean the same thing. So c and t, c but t, and c although and all of these say the same thing as the English sentence quine ate a cookie 
and Klein eight a tart. All right. So again, conjunction fairly straightforward. The strangest thing is probably the lack of an explicit symbol for it. But if that confuses you, just think of multiplication with which you are all familiar. So in basic algebra, we have expressions like 2x. Um, and 2x could also be written 2 times x like that, or uh, maybe x is a bad choice because 2 times x, uh, or x times 2. But most of the time in which you see it, you're going to see it um, implied. So conjunction is implied by the absence of any other connective. Um, and that's about all you need to know about conjunction right now. Okay. Moving on, our next logical operator is known as alternation. Um, in other logical systems, the name for this is disjunction. Uh, if you've taken like logic at community college or something, it was probably called this. Just a friendly tip. Um, okay, so if we consider our English sentence, I ate a donut or I drank coffee. Right, this is a sentence that is a compound statement, right? I ate a donut, something that's either true or false. I drank coffee, something that's either true or false. And the word that connects these two uh, statements is or, right? And so alternation uh, means, or alternation is the logical connective that captures what we ordinarily mean in English with the word or or kind of. I'll explain why it's only, why it only kind of captures the ordinary English meaning of or in a minute. Right, so uh, we will produce the truth table in a second, but the English definition of this is an alternation, alternation of any number, can't write today, any number of statements is true if at least one is true and otherwise false. So um, the way in which this operator works in our language, right, if, uh, if just one of the components of the alternation is true, the whole compound statement that is formed from the alternation is true. The only way an alternation can be false is if all of the components are false. So once again, we produce our truth table. I just realized I mixed up columns and rows. The, the two to the power of n thing is for um, rows, not columns. Anyway, uh, so we produce our truth table the same way before initially. So we survey all the possible combinations of values for p and q. So true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false, right? And then let's look at our definition and see if we can figure this out, p or Right? So if it's going to be true as long as one component's true, it's definitely true when both are. Here we look where P is true and Q is false. Well, one of them's true, so it's got to be true. Where P is false and Q is true, well, one of them's true, so it's got to be true. Where they're both false, it's false. Um, and the symbol that we use to represent alternation uh, in our symbolic language is, um, it looks like a V, um, but if you actually type it on a computer the right way, it's a little bit different. It's like a little bigger. Anyway, um, so if we were to put in for I ate a donut, the obvious uh, choice for a lowercase letter to uh, abbreviate that would be D, right? Or I drank coffee. Well, let's put that to 
c. So if we wanted to represent this whole statement in our symbolic language, we would write d, then this little v thing to symbolize alternation, or c. And we would read that uh, d or c. Um, there's probably another way to represent alternation in English, although I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, there is one funny thing about alternation, however, and that funny thing is, is that the word or in English actually is used in two different ways that have a different logical meaning. So here, what we just looked at, uh, this is known as the inclusive. Or, right? So if I say I ate a donut or I drank coffee, right? Um, depending on the context, that usually means that I did one or the other or both, right? So uh, the, for the inclusive or, the statement as a whole is true if one component is true or the other is true or both are true. There is another sense of or in English that is the exclusive or. Right, um, and we use this all the time too. Uh, so if we had the sentence, Klein will bake us a cake, or he'll be sorry, um, the way in which we'd usually use a sentence like that, the context indicates that we mean and not both. Right? Um, what that sentence doesn't say is it doesn't say, we wouldn't say that this sentence as a whole is true, right, if he baked us a cake and was sorry. Um, so be on the lookout. I won't give you uh, sentences to translate into the exclusive or, every time you see an or in English that you need to translate in this course, it will be the inclusive or. Uh, but on the off chance that you ever have to employ logic outside of this class, be aware, um, the, especially in a legal context where it could be very important, that occasionally we do mean or in the sense of and not both. Um, English is actually somewhat strange in that it doesn't have a different word for both of these. Uh, I know that Latin does. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but many languages have a different word for the exclusive or and the inclusive or. Just remember that we're only concerned with the inclusive or, which is adequately explained by our definition here and our truth table. Uh, and I think that is all you need to know about or. Okay, time to look at one more of our logical connectives. This connective is known as the material conditional, and the symbol that we use to represent it is this little arrow here, uh, like a one-sided arrow. Uh, if you took a logic in a community college, sometimes they use a horseshoe like that to represent it. Um, with my awful handwriting, every time I try to do that really fast, it turns into like a, a, an O or something, and then I just get really confused. So we're gonna use the arrow here, I think it's easier to draw. Um, okay, so the material conditional sort of corresponds to uh, the, the phrase if then, or if then statements in English, right? So uh, if we look at our sentence, which is a compound statement composed of the statements, I eat a pie and I'll be happy, right? Uh, the, sent this, uh, the components are connected by this if-then construction, right? Um, the way in which this connective works is kind of strange. So I say it corresponds to if and then in English. Um, that's something of an open question, or it's something of an open question as to how well it really does. Um, and there are certain sorts of if-then constructions that can't reasonably be translated into this form. Uh, however, I'm just not going to worry about that right now. You can assume for this course that anytime you see if then, it's going to be a conditional. Um, and it's going to be a conditional that can be represented this way and has the truth values that the truth table says that it does. Okay, so uh, 
This is a strange one, whereas or, uh, alternation, and conjunction, not negation, um, have a pretty clear meaning um, with respect to how the whole statement comes out true in virtue of its component statements. Uh, the material conditional is not as intuitive, right? So in English, we can say that the conditional is true in every case except that where the antecedent is true and the conclusion is false, or then the consequent is false, sorry. And right now you're probably asking, what's an antecedent? What's a consequent? What are these funny words? Um, so to translate our English sentence, let's put in uh, P for I eat a pie and H for I'll be happy. So we know that the material conditional uses an arrow. So this sentence would go into our language as P. Uh, I usually just read this as therefore. Q. Uh, you can also read it as if P then Q. Uh, th there are a few other ways in English to express this, but we'll cover translation in more detail later. Uh, so the first part of this, where the P is, is the antecedent. Hope I spelled that right. The second part, where the Q is, is the consequent. So based on our English sentence that explains the truth value of this, let's construct the truth table once again. So once again, this takes two statements as components. So we have first P, then Q, right? Uh, to be clear, there's no particular reason I'm choosing P and Q here other than tradition. For the truth tables, the letters don't particularly matter as long as they're different. Um, so once again, we get all our possible combinations of truth values out. It's true, false. Right, that gives us every combination of truth values that we can have for these two combinations. Then P, therefore Q. Uh, it's a really ugly Q. Better. Okay, so let's look at our definition and see if we can reason this out. The conditional is true in every case except that where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Okay, so we know the antecedent is the first part, the consequence the second part. So let's find the case where the antecedent is true and the consequence false. It's this one, right? Uh, in our conditional. Uh, you can hear my cat in the background. So if it's true in every other case except that one, true, 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 false, true, true, false, false, true, right? So this is the only case where it comes out false. And um, if you think about that, you might begin to like, understand why I said that this only kind of corresponds to if that in English. Uh, so let's consider the sentence. If Donald Trump is the president of France, then one plus one is equal to three, right? So uh, let's put F for Donald Trump is the president of France. That goes to a lowercase f. And uh, I'm just going to arbitrarily say that for one plus one is equal to three, we will use T. Right, so we would write this in our language F with an arrow to T. Right, so um, 
neither of these two component statements are true. Donald Trump's not the president of France, not very much of the president of America, um, and one plus one is not equal to three. So false, therefore false. Uh, I bet if I asked you before teaching you any logic whether this whole sentence was true, you would not say that it is. But if we consult our truth table, right, we see here the case where the antecedent is false and where the consequent is false, and we see that the conditional as a whole comes out true, right? So uh, this is an extremely important connective um, for reasons that will become clear around chapter six, but uh, you have to memorize the truth table for this one especially. Uh, it's, it's unintuitive that sentences like, if Donald Trump is the president of France, then one plus one equals three uh, come out true when we connect them with the material conditional, right? So commit this to memory, right? Uh, for this one, I think it might even be easier to just memorize the table than just to memorize the definition. But just remember, the only time that a compound uh, statement where the only time that a compound statement comes out false when that statement is connected with a material conditional is the case where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. That's the only time it's false. Um, don't worry too much about how weird this is or whether it corresponds to the ways in which we usually think of if and then, right? Just remember the truth table for this one. Um, and if you commit it to memory, I think you'll do fine. Okay, our final logical operator or logical connective, um, those words are synonymous, is the biconditional. Uh, and this is probably the logical connective that we use the least in ordinary everyday speech. Um, the most literal rendering of it is as if and only if, right? Um, it is very, very important in logic because this is the connective that represents logical equivalence. Again, don't worry too much about that, just know that it's important. Um, right? So fortunately, uh, as, as strange as it might be to use an expression like if and only if, uh, I don't think most people say that on a daily basis, uh, it's very, very easy to ascertain the truth value of a biconditional. Um, so uh, a compound of two statements connected by a biconditional is true if those statements have the same truth value. and false if they do not. All right, so uh, let's look once again at our truth table. Let's construct it. So once again, P, Q, again, the letters don't particularly matter, just tradition mandates that we choose P and Q. So we get every combination of truth values once again. Okay, let's look at our English sentence that explains this and try to figure it out. Oh, let me write this in real quick. Oh, and the symbol for the biconditional is a double-sided arrow. Um, I'm not really good at drawing them, but it, it's clear when you look at the book and the exercises. Okay, so the compound of two statements connected by a biconditional is true if those statements have the same truth value and false if they do not. So let's look. True, true. Well, those are the same truth values. So the biconditional is true. True, false. Not the same truth values. So it's false. False, true. Not the same truth values. So it's false. False, false. Same truth values. So it's true. Remember, a truth value is just 
true or false. Um, every statement has a truth value. That's what makes it a statement. It's either true or false. Uh, and despite the fancy sounding name, all that that means is true or false. There are two truth values, only two truth values, and they're just true or false. That's the only truth value. Uh, one, those are the only two truth values that there are. Okay. So I told you again that this translates expressions like if and only if. So if we, for I will sleep in, put an S, and if for it is the weekend, we put a W. We would translate this into our language, S. Uh, I just read the arrow as if and only if, W. And that is the biconditional. Um, and that's all you really need to know about it. OK, I have one very important piece of advice to give you at this point. And that piece of advice is that you must, 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 must memorize all of the truth tables that have been explained today and that are explicated in the second chapter of the book. These truth tables are the foundation of absolutely everything that we will learn going forward. It is impossible to explain to you now all the ways in which we will use them and make use of them to understand different things, um, different techniques as we progress, but you must commit them to memory. Memorizing these early uh, and accurately is perhaps the single most important thing that you can do to succeed in this class. So now that we've introduced all of our logical connectives, we have the symbols for them, we have the English sentences that say when they're true and false, uh, and the truth tables that represent that in a tabular form, right? What you need to do over the course of the next week is just memorize these. I would just write them all out once or twice a day. It takes barely any time, and the version of you that will exist four weeks from now will thank yourself so much for doing that. Okay, so now that we've introduced all of our truth tables, what we need to do is explain what a schema is. So you've already seen a schema. Schemas are things like P or Q or P, therefore Q, right? So a schema, one second, a schema is a sentence in our logical language. Uh, the plural of schema is schemata. Uh, that's an important thing to know just for reading the book. Um, right? And so uh, thus, for the first part of this course at least, uh, our schema is going to consist of lowercase letters such as P, Q, R, A, B, C, it doesn't really matter which letters we choose. And these letters stand for statements. Right? Now, uh, moving forward, we will not know exactly which statements our letters represent. One of the powerful things that logic allows us to do is to prove that certain sorts of relations between sentences hold in virtue of their truth values alone, whether or not they're true or false. And this can be useful because we can know uh, certain things, uh, certain relations, certain inferences uh, must be true or must be false, right, uh, without actually knowing the specific content of those statements. So. Going forward, you know, f f up until now, I've always been plugging in real English statements um, for these variables. But going forward, we'll frequently be dealing with variables we don't know what they represent. We haven't translated anything into them yet. Um, we're just examining their logical structure and the relations that obtain between um, uh, different sorts of statements or uh, schemata that represent statements. 
So the other ingredient of any one of our logical schemata is uh, our logical connectives. So also known as logical operators. And we know by this point that we have negation, which we represent with that thingy or a bar over the P. We have conjunction, which we represent uh, with the absence of a symbol, so just PQ. We have alternation, zoom in, P or Q. We have the conditional, P, therefore Q. And we have the biconditional, P, if and only if, Q. So that's all there is to a schema at this point. Our logical operators combine with lowercase letters that represent statements. Um, so just a few examples of the ways. Oh, wait, actually, I forgot something very important. We also use parentheses. Parentheses for grouping. For now, at least, we're going to adopt an alternative grouping system in the next chapter or two. So this is a schema in our language. Um, and we could read this as uh, if P, then Q and R. Uh, this is another schema in our language. It's Q. And we could read this as P or Q and R. Uh, similarly, this is a schema in our language. And we would read this uh, as it is not the case, uh, or not, not P or Q, but a better way of reading this might be neither P nor Q. Right. Um, you don't have to, to translate anything elaborate right now. I'm just giving you an example of what these look like. OK. So there's one final topic that I have to cover, and that is I have to explain in what sense our operators uh, and our schemata are truth functional. So to say that a uh, compound uh, of statements is truth functional is to say that the truth of the whole depends only on the truth, truth values of the components. Right, so that's what it means for something to be truth functional. There's a, a, probably a more elaborate definition I could give that would actually reference the mathematical definition of a function, but let's just ignore that. So that's what it means for something to be truth functional. Um, and in order to illustrate this, let's make up some sentences. Uh, so let's let P stand for Donald Trump is the president of France. Let's let Q stand for 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. And let's let R stand for uh, California is the most populous US state. Um, so it should be obvious that uh, P is false, 
right? Q is false, and R is, unless something has changed dramatically in the past few minutes, true. So, uh, in order to help you through the first set of homework exercises, let's consider a few compound statements made up of these components, right? So the first one I want to look at is P, Q, R. So this, remember, is a conjunction. Another way of reading this would be P and Q and R, right? So if we want to figure out whether or not the whole statement is true, what we do is we plug in our truth values. So false for Donald Trump is the president of France, false for one plus one is equal to three, and true for California is the most populous US state. Okay, so because this is a conjunction, right? Conjunction. Uh, and because we scroll up, conjunction, 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 because we know that a conjunction of any number of statements is true if they all are true and false if at least one is false, we know that this conjunction, PQR, of these three statements is false, right? Um, and we know that because of the truth table definition for conjunction. So uh, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. Uh, let's go P, if P, then Q or R, right? So again, we know that P is false. Uh, Q is also false, and R is true. So what's the truth value of the whole compound statement here? Um, well, we could look at our truth tables for alternation first, but if we look up at our truth table for the conditional, conditional, we see the conditional is true in every case, except where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So we look at our truth table and we notice that for every case where the antecedent, the first part, the P, is false, the whole compound comes out true. So this whole statement, uh, P, if P, then Q or R, is true. Right? Um, and I think that gives you enough of a hint to start doing the exercises in the book. And that is everything you need to know for this chapter. Uh, I apologize for the somewhat shoddy production value on this week's videos. Uh, again, I was hired to teach this class on very short notice. Um, it'll be considerably higher going forward. And I hope that this suffices to help you get through the exercises and the quiz. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me or post in the Logic Help Board. Um, yeah, good luck with the material. I hope you all uh, enjoy the course.